So um, your diverse population of trees, you have this invasive come in and it's gonna kill most of the susceptibles. Some are gonna die before the other ones. So what you've had is this selection event. So by definition, you have increased the proportion of resistant trees in the population because you've killed off a lot of the susceptible trees, but you do have some susceptible trees that are surviving. So when you have a higher proportion of resistant trees, there's a greater chance that they're going to be parents in the next generation. So in the next generation, you can see some increase in um, the population level of resistance. And it is still going to be under pressure. So some of the susceptible trees that have made it through, you're going to continue to see them die off, especially in that next generation. And so in the context of what you're trying to accomplish today, it's going to be important to, to understand if you are at a selection event and at what point. Are you at the, the first generation or the second generation? <laughs> so how long has it been? Have you had selection pressure long enough to actually see that selection event? Um, just something to think about. And then as far as breeding programs, those come into play when you have something like emerald ash borer that, well, if, if you just want a consistent seed source so that gives you a consistent known amount of resistance so you know how much it's going to survive, that's one reason to do a breeding program. But also it can be an absolute necessity when you have these incredibly damaging invasives that kill so many trees that after the selection event, the surviving trees are so few and far between that there's no way they're going to actually be able to reach each other and cross pollinate. And so without breeding programs to preserve these valuable trees and bring them together, you're going to face extinction of that species. So what is tree breeding? It's defined as an iterative process of selection, mating, and testing with the goal of producing improved population of parent trees for the production of genetically diverse adapted seed. This is from an, an article referenced below. And we're starting right here, trying to use natural selection to our advantage to develop a protocol to select trees from natural forests that have the best chance of having some resistance. And it's iterative in, in a couple of different ways. One, depending on the goals of the program, you can go through many cycles of breeding and testing, selecting the best trees to develop a seed orchard, and then producing improved seedlings. And every cycle of this you go through, you can get increased gain or increased improvement in the level and frequency of resistance in your population. Um, but the other iter iterative part of this process is the challenge of breeding for range-wide forest restoration, especially for very wide-ranging species, like we're talking about, I've shown here a green ash, but hemlock, you can't just collect your parent trees from North Carolina where you're at, put together a seed orchard, and then expect those seedlings to be appropriate to plant up where I'm at right now in Ohio. So the process of identifying parent trees, establishing seed orchards um, to, to produce seeds, improved seeds, has to be repeated across the entire range and with new genotypes appropriate to those areas. So I wanted to talk a little too about the goals of forest restoration um, and this idea of the resistance ladder. And I talked about that a little bit when I talked about the range of phenotypes. We are not looking for 100% resistance. That is not the goal. The goal is to shift the population from highly susceptible and increase the level and frequency of resistance. So the other goals of forest restoration are that in the process of doing that, of increasing resistance, we wanna also make sure we're maintaining genetic diversity. We want to do so so that we have a population that's resilient to adapt to cl changing climate, future pests and pathogens. We want to retain regional adaptive traits so that we can we know where we can plant these seeds, where they're adapted, and, and following climate models maybe where they would be adapted to in, for future climates. We need to have a population that has a survival rate of trees that reach maturity sufficient enough so that they can reproduce and continue that evolution under natural selection that I was describing in the first at the beginning. 
cultivars can be an offshoot of this process, but they're not the primary goal for forest restoration. That's sort of a different little niche that I'm not going to talk about, just wanted to mention. So the actual steps in breeding, I, this is very compressed and simplified. Uh, again, where, where we're starting with the discussions today is selecting candidate resistant trees in diverse natural stands, also called lingering ash trees. The next step is to preserve and propagate them. This can be done either by clonally propagating your trees once they're selected and planting them in archive plantings where you're using insecticides or whatever it takes to keep them alive, or you can do seed collections, store those seeds, and also germinate um, the seed. The next uh, very important step is testing, and that's verifying or phenotyping, verifying the resistance phenotypes, being able to distinguish resistant from susceptible trees using either a bioassay, screens, test plantings. And um, you can start by using the clonal replications that you made in the previous step or the open pollinated seed, or maybe by this point, you're even doing some controlled cross pollinations and breeding. I skipped ahead, but <laughs> let me just keep going down this thing. Um, the next step after that would be genetic studies. So that is, is um, demonstrating that breeding can produce improved population, that the trait is heritable, passed down from parents to progeny. Your tests have given you enough information to estimate that, that heritable trait. And this is, and I put a box around the testing and the phenotyping because that is so important to this whole process. Because if you cannot have a phenotype and, and distinguish between resistant and susceptible trees in a quantitative and reproducible manner, you won't be able to confirm that your trait is resistant, that you, your trait is heritable, sorry. Um, so if resistance isn't a heritable trait, we don't know that you'll get gain through breeding. It might just be environmental influences. So with the adelgia, we know exposure to sunlight has an impact, for example. This must be on a timer. Um, so that without um, appropriate phenotyping, a breeding program is not going to be successful. The other thing I wanted to point out about the phenotyping is that this will allow us to figure out how well our selection criteria are doing. Because once the trees are selected and we test them, we can determine how many of them actually have some level of resistance. We can use that information to then improve this protocol or change it if it's needed. So we don't have to be perfect right out of the bat. Um, but we do have to develop this method of phenotyping. And to my knowledge, we don't yet have confirmation that resistance to the hemlock woolly adelgid is a genetically heritable trait. Although we do have a lot of evidence that um, I think we'll be hearing about that indicates that it's highly likely it is a heritable trait. And I wanted to take a little bit of time just to talk about what tree breeding is not because this is a lot of the terms that are um, you hear a lot about. They get a lot of attention in, in science journals and the press because um, they're controversial in some cases like transgenics, genetically modified organisms, gene editing. This is not tree breeding. Um, people talk about identifying a resistance mechanisms. You've probably heard about omics, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics often being used to identify, and I have it in quote, candidates for rapid selection of resistance or to identify these resistance mechanisms. As I said before, we don't need to understand all of the resistance, the, the mechanisms of resistance to be able to breed. We just need to be able to do tests that can distinguish between resistant and susceptible. Um, and I also want to point out that it's very rare that these candidates that are identified are verified or even used. Genomic markers, um, that's not tree breeding, but it can enhance tree breeding by confirming parentage, assessing genetic diversity, and identifying subpopulations across the range. So it helps inform your strategy for breeding and, and seed orchards and where you're gonna put them all. So you've probably heard of SNPs and SSRs and those sort of things. Um, so these tools, they're not breeding, they're not required for successful breeding, but they can enhance and guide breeding programs and they have the potential to accelerate breeding, but it's very difficult to develop them and it's impossible to apply them in the absence of a breeding program and none of them can replace breeding. The Forest Service has been 
breeding programs that are deploying resistance for over 50 years. And so far, none of these have used any of these technologies. We are close to coming to the, for the first, but I just wanna emphasize that it's important not to put the cart before the horse when you're talking about breeding programs. And that what you're doing today is talking about the most important part, starting the actual breeding program, identifying trees that can potentially be parent trees in a breeding program, establishing that breeding program first, then it can be leveraged to support other technological research. We need to do this wisely. Um, we need to think about cost benefit analysis because if it's too costly to develop or even implement, it's not going to be used, then that's maybe not a good investment. But also be aware that breeding and, and producing improved seed sources for these very wide ranging species that have um, incredible impacts from these invasive insects and diseases in order to accomplish that at the pace and scale that we really need may not be possible without the technologies to accelerate the process. So we just wanna make sure we're going about things in the correct way and being very thoughtful about it. So thanks to you, to the Hemlock Monitoring Working Group for putting together the protocol that we'll be discussing and, and optimizing and debating today. Thanks to all of you for attending and your, and your participation. Thanks to Rachel Kapler and all of the others involved in, in organizing this. And we look forward to having some great discussions. Oops. All right, thank you, Jen, so much um, for that. It'll help us with everything we're doing today. Let's see, okay, it's trying to- I have Two presenters listed here because a lot of the material that I'm presenting was actually also developed by my partner in this um, endeavor, uh, Radka Vildova. And uh, so um, uh, I know the initial title of this had the word breeding in it, but because we don't actually do the breeding and um, folks such as um, Jennifer have all these great insights that she shared with you about breeding and have been in the trenches regarding breeding programs. Um, she gave a great <coughs> presentation on that. What I'm gonna focus on is the kind of other side of this is how we have gone about in the case of Ash going about and um, finding lingering ash trees and issues that we've encountered, uh, positive and negative, not just dealing with the ash trees, but dealing with the people that we need to deal with to deal with the ash trees and kind of all of um, maybe our sociological insights that we've gained along the way and how those can potentially have some lessons for um, hemlock, um, finding lingering hemlocks and reading them and so forth. And a quick disclaimer is that I'm uh, very aware that um, hemlock and ash are rather different from each other. Their pests are rather different from each other. Their pest management is rather different. There are a whole lot of differences. So one thing I'm not advocating is uh, copying and pasting what we've done with ash to hemlock, but there may be some common ground and I'm hoping there's some common ground because that is what's uh, led me here. So I don't know if folks um, at home in uh, television land can see the top of this slide, um, which I can't, but uh, I can yeah. see it on my computer. So two converging paths have led me here. I'm, so I'm a hybrid. I'm an ash hemlock hybrid. You may not have known that such things are biologically possible, but I'm coniferous and... Uh, and I bear uh, windblown sea, I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so uh, from the Ecological Research Institute, and we work both on hemlock and on ash. And for hemlock, we've done all sorts of work, including monitoring pest-induced health decline in relation to environmental variables. So I'm not gonna go into that graph of uh, uh, PCA in, in great detail or any detail. It's just meant that uh, 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 there is a little um, almost cartoon to show you how we try to relate actually many, many more variables than that to show different rates of tree decline when we incorporate environmental variables, spatial variables, history of um, <laughs> HWA and EHS attack and so forth. So that's, we're not going to delve into it deeper uh, now. And we also have our monitoring and managing ash program. Uh, we came up with that name so that we could generate the acronym MAMA, and uh, it's memorable. And our tagline is, you know, come to MAMA, and MAMA knows best. You know, you can go on and on with all this stuff. And um, we used to make, you know, all the jokes about kissing your ash goodbye and so forth. And that was 
we, that was frowned upon. So we went all the way in the other direction to very family friendly uh, uh, name and, and verbiage. Uh, so that's a large scale project to enable detection of lingering ash that have defied EAB pressure. I'm going to try to change slides now. This is the most challenging thing I think we've ever done in MAMA. Let's see. Yes. So uh, MAMA is based on the findings by Jennifer Cook, Kathleen Knight et al., which you've already heard a bit about. And I won't even, uh, so they've showed that cyan from lingering ash can yield grafted trees with substantial likelihood of some level of EAB resistance slash tolerance, which through selective breeding can yield highly resistant trees. And they were doing this um, in an area of Ohio and Michigan near the Northern Forest Research Station. And uh, based on resistance assessments, they empirically developed a very strict operationalized uh, definition or criteria for lingering ash, which are untreated trees of at least 10 centimeters dBH that have, complete, that have completely healthy canopies. These are trees that aren't just limping along, but that are completely healthy in areas where at least 95% of the adult ash have been dead due to EAB for, uh, that 95 shouldn't be there. It's not 952 years, for at least two years, okay? So there are a lot of at least there. And um, these were, they, they um, empirically derived these criteria because following these will produce ash trees, uh, will, will yield material that has a substantial likelihood of having some level of resistance, okay? We revised their field methods to make them more accessible to the public, but just as rigorous and built this into an overall framework for ash monitoring and management. Because as, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, you can't just go out and find trees that are well adapted in, um, in Ohio and expect them to work in North Carolina or New York or what have you. So you need um, basically coverage of that species throughout its range across all its environmental variables and get lots of also genetic diversity. So we're not setting ourselves up for the next disaster. So we wanted to create a program that can involve, that can involve um, citizen scientists and a wide range of natural resource professionals. So uh, MAMA has been implemented in areas of New York and Vermont, and now through uh, the Nature Conservancy's Tree Species in Peril initiative, it's expanding throughout New York and New England. And its data collectors, as I mentioned, include citizen scientists and natural resource professionals. Um, we can, you, you can try and tell them apart here, like the right, the, the guy on the right, little fella right there, natural resource professional, I fooled you there, that's because that's my son and he's been doing this since he was about two years old, so he called, he wanted to come here and co-present with me today, but he had to be in school, all right, uh, Mama Monitoring Plots Network is main, is one of the uh, several components of the Mama program, and its main purpose is to determine when the mortality threshold in an area has been met, triggering the search for lingering ash. It says it has already revealed um, over 30 lingering ash in, a, in the small portion of the Hudson Valley that's been invaded long enough for that mortality threshold that, you know, at least 95% of the trees killed by um, EAB for at least two years that that mortality threshold has been reached. So as that um, heavily invaded area spreads, right, which is spread over time, um, and as we get more folks involved, and as we have really are ramping things up through uh, the uh, Tree Species in Peril program, we expect to find lots more trees. So this is a really in a very small area, and we're really happy with the effectiveness of the program. That's a lingering ash tree in um, somewhere in the Hudson Valley, and those are not ash trees around it. Those are other trees. If you were to find any ash trees in that area, they are phenomenally dead. Okay. Um, so although our initial purpose in setting up uh, this monitoring plot program was to detect when thresholds that have been met, we've realized that there are other important benefits we're getting from them as well. One is we're able to compare across <laughs> plots and infer regional trends and environmental influences on mortality trajectories. So some things are, uh, you know, we haven't analyzed these rigorously yet, but there's some plots where the, uh, where the uh, um, mortality trajectories are much faster than others. And uh, we're going to do that kind of analysis and try and tease apart these variables. Um, and one thing we're really looking forward to doing is working with Jill W, who will be speaking later, 
uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. It has lots of consonants and I think no vowels. And uh, you, you can do it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, use Cartagra plant to relate um, environmental um, GIS layers to the uh, mortality trajectories and health trajectories that we found in our monitoring plots. Um, establishing plots also provides outreach opportunities and informational opportunities. So a lot of those slides, of those photos you saw earl earlier were from when a partner institution sets up a monitoring plot and, inv and invites uh, their members and their staff and so forth. And it's a really great opportunity to teach people about the pest and about the, uh, the plant that it affects. Um, and then also data from the monitoring plots um, have frequently, we frequently use them to dispel misimpressions about local status of the match. So um, one thing that we've come across is um, it, where we are in, uh, in, uh, in based in the Hudson Valley of New York is that often when anybody sees a um, dead ash tree or dying ash tree, they assume that it's due to EAB. And, you know, ash trees were dying long before EAB even arrived, especially where we are. Um, ash yellows is basically endemic. And so we'll have people telling us, yeah, the EAB has killed all the trees. And then we'll go, we'll, in the process of setting up a plot, we'll inspect the trees, we'll debark some of them, and there'll be no trace of EAB, right? And it really changes the management options and the management trajectory because they've already given up that EAB, you know, it's not, and there are other things. And luckily, ash yellows tends to kill things more slowly than EAB. Um, another uh, really common misimpression is there's like an emotional reaction when people see some trees dying off. Even due to EAB, they will go into this emotional state of, oh no, all my trees, all my ash, or virtually all of them have been killed. They're, they're all gone. And uh, we've become kind of armchair psychologists in, in this program. And it's probably around 50% threshold when about 50% of the ash trees have died, people will tell us they're all dead or 95% are dead. And then we'll go there and it turns out the mortality is actually 50%. And again, that actually means that you're not ready to collect uh, to collect material from lingering ash, but it also kind of sets the clock back in terms of your uh, management trajectory. Uh, so um, challenges and solutions that we've encountered. Uh, so um, one thing is that when the areas have reached the stage where virtually all the ash are dead, that's when you want to get out there and look for the lingering trees, right? for the truly lingering trees. But it's also the stage when people resign themselves to there being nothing that can be done to save ash. So um, one thing that we've done is, uh, and I did not include this, this slide in the, in the interest of time, is we've taken the four stages of EAB invasion and we've mapped those onto the, so the four, um, I probably should have included it, uh, the four stages of invasion of, of where you're not invaded yet, you're, it's just a new invasion, it progresses, and then ultimately you end up in the fourth final stage where virtually all the trees are dead. And we've uh, created a graphic of the four emotional stages of uh, EAB invasion. So people tend to be in the resignation stage there. And getting folks motivated to go out, to even come to a workshop, to find out that they should be participating in a program to look for lingering trees can be really difficult because in their minds, um, ash in their area has already gone the way of the dinosaurs. They're, they're irretrievably gone and, quote, all the trees are dead. And we'll find that when we visit those areas, um, you know, they'll, they're on occasion maybe one or more actually healthy trees that nobody's even noticed because nobody is looking. Um, so the solution is the task chart and action maps. I, I see one person in the audience is familiar with these, I think. So um, I don't know if you can see the, um, the folks at home uh, watching on TV, you can see the tasks for each stage of, EA, of EAB infestation. And so there are tasks that go all the way from pre-infestation to late infestation, right? So we um, publicize this chart as part of all of our work, um, all of our outreach materials to stress that there are things you can do to set the stage for lingering ash detection you know, before you've even been invaded, and especially after you've been highly invaded and had lots of the trees die, right? So that area all the way on the right, that's really important. So instead of resigning yourself 
to um, ash trees being, you know, the passenger pigeons, <laughs> we'll, we'll put it that way, that you can still do something and we need you to do that. So that's our task, excuse me, our task chart. And then we have um, action maps that we generate for uh, regions based on um, data that we get from the monitoring plots and also some other data sources. But if you look at this uh, action map, this is for the lower Hudson Valley. And if you look up in kind of the top middle, there's like an ochre portion. And that's an area that's been really long um, in, in, infested. And so what we use is um, detection history data from that we got from uh, state agencies, federal agencies, and other sources. Uh, so we know that that's where, that's basically the ground zero of EAB invasion in Eastern New York. And that area, and, and I'll say, and we complement it with um, information from our monitoring plot. So if you look really carefully, you see uh, a number up there, I think it's um, 97 or 98%, something like that, by the, the stars indicate our monitoring plots. And below it, there's one that's 100%. So sure enough, those areas that have been long invaded meet those criteria. Sometimes there will be um, a mismatch, right? And often we'll find places that are really heavily, have very high mortality, but not that long history of invasion, and it can be that they're overlooked early in the invasion, or it can be that mortality that uh, the environment has driven more rapid mortality, right? Um, so anyway, this lower uh, th these action maps are downloadable and they're um, interactive, right? So people can load them on their phones, and as they drive down the road, or load them on their some device, as they drive down the road, they could say, I'm now in a zone that's ripe for lingering ash search, right? Because we haven't yet been able to arrange for highway departments to put up signs along the road that say, now entering a lingering ash search area, right? <laughs> and these are dynamic, we change them with new data, um, but um, it's a way for people to see how they can be engaged at these different stages. And just more challenges and solutions, uh, a general lack of awareness of lingering tree detection coupled with selective breeding as a conservation and restoration tool. This ties into what Jennifer was talking about, is that um, there's there are lots of misperceptions about it, misconceptions, and um, it's really a potentially important tool. We know it's, I won't say potentially, it is an important tool in the case of ASH because all, all the work that Jennifer and her colleagues have done, and it's very likely that it can play a role also with hemlock. Um, so what's the solution? Education and outreach. Um, ne next challenge is the percep perception, and this also relates to something that Jennifer said, perception of um, artificial, artificial selection acting on quantitative inheritance as an insufficient uh, technique. That's not a magic bullet. So uh, we've given many workshops and, um, and usually people are actually receptive. They're kind of like, wow, I didn't know. There's actually hope. There are things we can do and so forth. But at one of them, one particular gentleman, when he was informed that it's not typically complete resistance, it's not like we have the magic bullet, the magic tree that you can just breed and save all the ash. He got up, he said, oh, well, then what's the point of it? Uh, if the, they're not completely resistant, they're going to die anyway, and, and marched out <clears throat> quite loudly. Uh, <laughs> So that's a, a, you know, so I think the, the information that Jennifer gave, and we'll amplify on it here, is that, you know, these two <coughs> coupled together, finding the lingering trees, where natural selection is doing a big help of finding those trees for you, coupled with artificial selection is a really powerful tool. Again, if there's that, if there is that genetic basis, if there is heritable resistance slash tolerance, and I'll, I'm, I'm just have a couple more slides. And, uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm almost almost there. And uh, management, so, uh, management uh, next challenge is management approaches that inhibit lingering ash detection. So especially proactive cutting, what we've come uh, to in some places, the word has gotten out, um, you just cut down all of your ash trees, right? If you want to get any value out of your timber or, um, and this is really bad, cut all your ash trees and that will prevent EAB from spreading which is actually not true. You cut all your ash trees and because EAB is a directed flyer, it'll go to the next nearest ash trees and actually spread further faster. That's not, I wouldn't say that would be the case for EAB because they're not direct, uh, for um, HWA because they're not direct. But it's something that we run into. 
So there are management approaches that um, inhibit lingering ash detection, including proactive cutting, but also insecticide application, right? If you're applying insecticide to your trees, you'll never know if any of them would ultimately turn out to be lingering ash because they're healthy because it could be because and likely because the insecticide is effective. Um, so solution is to demonstrate how lingering ash detection can be integrated into an overall management strategy. In other words, we're not going out and saying to people, do not cut trees. There are really good reasons to cut trees. We're not saying do not treat them chemically. So we have a conceptual decision tree here where kind of the, the two boxes on the left, cut if and treat if, are, are kind of the traditional management responses, right? Like we've got to do something about EAV. We've got to either cut our trees down or we've got to treat them, right? And the trees that are neither cut nor treated are standing testaments to your incompetence as a land manager or your lack of will or knowledge or resources or what those other trees you're just leaving to die. And it's not the case, right? Because those trees that you're leaving standing, certainly as long as they're alive, can be used for monitoring plots, right? And can also be used just to have enough of a representation of trees that some of those, even if they're very rare, um, lingering trees will ultimately materialize, right? So we try to work with forestry professionals and so forth to say, how we how can you integrate this into an overall approach? And I can see that also being a, an issue with, uh, with hemlock. Um, Next, um, just in general, we're challenged by a lack of patience. And it's good to, and, 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 uh, and um, a lack of long-term perspective. So it's good to be, I guess, impatient and motivated and care about your trees, but you have to also have a long-term perspective, right? So you may have short-term goals, which is realizing that income from your timber and so forth, but also if you want to restore and maintain ash over the long haul, integrating um, the, that long-term perspective into your management approaches. So education and outreach can foster long-term perspective. And another thing that we'll touch on, something that uh, Jennifer was mentioning, also if genomic or phenotypic, phenotypic analysis can help ID lingering trees, right? This isn't a replacement for breeding, make the same point. This could eventually obviate, eventually obviate need for waiting until mortality thresholds reach, thereby accelerating advancement. In other words, if we could go and, and do what, um, the, uh, I think Ian Kinahan will use this term, chemotyping, right? Going out if there are chemicals that confer a degree of resistance or tolerance, and you can go out and um, find those trees that have those leaves that have those chemicals. Again, this is maybe wishful thinking, but um, then you don't have to necessarily go through waiting for all these trees to die. But at this point of the process, with hemlock, we do need to do that, right? Because we need to find those lingering trees and then identify maybe those properties that we can use to, to identify them more quickly. And just wrapping up, I want to thank everyone who's made this workshop possible. And also to all of our uh, more than 40 partners in the MAMA program. And as you see, you can, you can participate in the MAMA program if you're clean shaven, as in the case on the right or if you have a really big beard going on, we welcome all, everybody, or, you know, whatever, anybody's welcome to participate in, in, in MAMA from uh, two to 102. And uh, thank you, that's it. All right, great, thank you. Okay, uh, this is a very encouraging um, conference because I felt like throughout my entire graduate career, I was banging my head against a wall, talking to people about lingering Eastern hemlocks and potential adelgid resistance. So uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I'll just dive right in. Basically, I'm Ian Kinahan. I'm an ecologist with Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And I am giving this presentation today because part of my graduate thesis work focused on evaluating lingering Eastern hemlocks for adelgid resistance in hemlock woolly adelgid devastated forests. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard this presentation before. So um, what I'm going to do is basically review my advisor, Dr. Evan Pricer, and his collaborator, Richard Casagrande, and their research on this topic over the last 15 years or so. And then I'll finish up with my thesis work, which sort of ties it all together. So up to now, there have been these two primary approaches to hemlock woolly adelgid management. Insecticide treatment, which is very effective at perfect, uh, protecting individual eastern hemlocks, but can't be applied at a landscape scale. 
and biological control, which can be applied at the landscape scale, but unfortunately we don't currently have an agent available for rapid and effective protection of our uh, remaining trees. So what I'm discussing today is a new approach, and that is evaluating lingering eastern hemlocks for adelgid resistance. And this work uh, has involved testing for adelgid resistance in hemlocks lingering in adelgid devastated forests and propagation and reforestation with the most resistant individuals. Um, and just as a quick disclaimer, I'm going to be using the term we to refer to work collectively done on this subject, because as I said, this has spanned 15 years, and it's just easier to refer to all of this work as we rather than divided up by who did what. So <clears throat> the conceptual framework for this research on lingering hemlocks is based on three basic lines of evidence. So first, Hemlock woolly adelgid is passively dispersed, and so it basically acts like a smokeless wildfire. And so what it does is it sweeps through an area, but instead of eliminating everything in, it, in its path, um, adelgid likely kills off the most susceptible hemlocks more rapidly. Um, second, plant resistance to herbivory is broadly considered to be polygenic uh, or controlled by multiple genes. And Jennifer Cook did a much better uh, job of explaining this earlier, but essentially, um, you know, plant resistance to herbivory can show up in a population um, with individuals ranging from completely susceptible to herbivory to individuals in a plant population being completely resistant to herbivory. Um, and third, 11 of 13 hemlock species are resistant to or tolerant of adelgid. So Chinese hemlock has uh, repeatedly been shown to be adelgid resistant. Western hemlock, Asian hemlock species, and dwarf Eastern hemlock cultivars sustain lower adelgid densities and have different needle terpene profiles compared to adelgid susceptible hemlock species. And so we know that adelgid resistance already occurs naturally in the majority of hemlock species. Um, and so based on these three lines of evidence, we developed the following four research objectives. So first, we wanted to locate any mature, healthy eastern hemlocks lingering in adelgid devastated forests. We wanted to propagate cuttings from these trees for adelgid resistance trials in a controlled setting. We wanted to evaluate anti-herbivore defense chemistry of lingering hemlocks. And then finally, evaluate the potential for lingering hemlocks to be used in reforestation. So <clears throat> I'll start with research objective one locating healthy lingering eastern hemlocks in adelgid devastated forests. So back in the early 2000s, we sent out this brochure that you can see here to um, environmental conservation groups up and down the East Coast. And we were asking these groups to report any instances of healthy individual eastern hemlocks that they find lingering in adelgid devastated forests. And so this is the front of the brochure and this is the back. And you can see in the far right panel, our criteria for potentially adelgid resistant hemlocks. So we were looking for trees that um, had deep green needles full of thick branches. These trees had to be mature or at least 30 feet tall. The trees had to be growing within a forest stand. So in a natural setting and not treated with insecticides and lingering hemlocks that we were interested in had to be surrounded by at least 95% mortality of the surrounding hemlock population. And so we uh, sent these out um, and uh, it was a big success. We had hundreds of responses from groups like the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry, New Jersey Department of Agriculture, and many others. You know, these people were sending us GPS coordinates and photos of uh, lingering, healthy lingering hemlocks that they were finding in adelgid devastated forests that they had been tracking and monitoring for years. And so later, our lab went out and surveyed these sites. And these are just a few examples of what we found. So this is an area in the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. And you can see healthy Eastern hemlocks surrounded by dead trees. I have many of these photos. This is an area um, of hemlock forest outside of Lake Wall and Pawpack in Pennsylvania. And the black splotches inside of these red polygons were stands of Eastern hemlock back in the early 90s. And what I'm going to show you next is the same area in 2017. And look, you can see all the trees have died except for the um, hemlocks that I outlined in green here. And I have personally been to this site 
and ground truth this data. And these trees in green are healthy eastern hemlocks surrounded by um, stands of dead hemlock trees. And so in total, um, as of when I graduated uh, in 2020, we had found 147 lingering eastern hemlocks identified at 18 sites across Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So that brought us to uh, research objective two, propagating cuttings from lingering hemlocks for adelgid resistance trials in a controlled setting. So back in 2007, um, we propagated stem cuttings from lingering eastern hemlocks located at five sites across Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Um, after uh, six months, we uh, the successfully rooted stem cuttings were uh, transplanted into pots, and they were grown alongside potted up adelgid susceptible eastern hemlocks that had been um, uh, the susceptible trees were just randomly selected seedlings collected from. Uh, Cadwell Forest in Western Massachusetts. And so the trees were grown um, together under identical conditions in a greenhouse for a month. We inoculated them with the Delgid, and our results are shown in this figure on the left. So you can see in the green box, lingering eastern hemlock propagules on average sustain lower Adelgid densities compared to the Adelgid susceptible hemlocks, which are outlined in the black box on the far left. And so this was, you know, an intriguing finding. It was a good place to start. But because we were comparing um, adelgid densities on seedlings versus propagules from mature trees in a greenhouse, we wanted to evaluate the lingering trees in a more robust controlled greenhouse study. And so in 2011, we followed up on this work and we propagated stem cuttings from the uh, 20 of our most promising lingering eastern hemlocks located at sites in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And we simultaneously propagated stem cuttings from adelgid susceptible hemlocks, as well as uh, we propagated st stem cuttings from a set of Western hemlocks. And Western hemlock, as I said earlier, um, sustains lower adelgid densities and is considered to be tolerant. Um, so again, uh, successful rooted cuttings from all three of these groups were potted up and grown under identical conditions, this time for two years. We inoculated them all with the Delgid, and our results are shown in the figure on the right. You can see the lingering eastern hemlocks. There's no significant difference in Adelgid densities on lingering eastern hemlocks compared to um, western hemlock. And additionally, lingering eastern hemlocks sustain lower Adelgid densities compared to the susceptible trees. So that brought us to research objective three, trying to figure out if there was any difference in the um, anti-herbivore defense chemistry of lingering eastern hemlocks. Um, so back in 2014, in order to address this objective, our collaborator Joe Elkinton and his graduate student Alexa McKenzie compared the needle and twig terpene concentrations in lingering eastern hemlocks compared to adelgid susceptible hemlocks in both field and greenhouse settings. And so what they did was Joe and Alexa, they went out to these um, uh, a field site in New Jersey where a stand of eight lingering eastern hemlocks that are exceptionally healthy uh, were growing surrounded by dead hemlocks. This is referred to colloquially as our bulletproof stand. They're the ones that have been studied most extensively. So Joe and Alexa went out and they collected um, needle and twig samples from these New Jersey lingering trees at six different uh, time periods between May 2012 and June 2013. And they also, at the same time, collected foliage and twig samples from adelgid susceptible hemlocks that were growing within a five kilometer radius of the lingering trees. So to control for any potential microclimate or soil conditions. Uh, so they collected these samples, brought them back to the lab, and <clears throat> they uh, did their chemical analysis and their results are shown in these boxes here. So the um, top row of each box represents the type of tissue sampled, whether it be needle or twig tissue, um, as well as the sampling date. And then the far left column represents each individual terpene whose concentration was measured uh, in these samples. And their results are indicated by the colored boxes. So light gray boxes indicate cases where terpene concentrations were at least 5% lower in lingering 
compared to susceptible hemlock samples. Dark gray boxes indicate cases where terpene concentrations were at least 5% higher in lingering trees compared to susceptible trees. And white boxes uh, indicate cases where uh, terpene concentrations um, in lingering versus susceptible trees fell within 5% of each other. So there was no considerable difference. And so, you know, looking here, you can see that for the majority of terpenes sampled and across most of the sampling dates, uh, terpene concentrations were substantially higher in lingering compared to susceptible tree samples. Um, so this was, you know, a pretty intriguing finding, but again, because we were comparing samples that were collected from trees of, you know, in the field, uh, we couldn't rule out the possibility of environmental noise impacting these results. And so what I'm going to show you next is this same set of chemical analyses, but performed on our two-year-old greenhouse trees, remember, that had been grown under identical conditions. And just look at this figure in the red box on the right. Terpene concentrations were significantly higher in lingering eastern hemlock twigs compared to adelgid susceptible twigs for all terpenes measured across all sampling dates. And the reason I always emphasize this figure on the right isn't because the results are more convenient to, you know, what we're talking about today. It's because adelgid, it, it feeds via stem tissue. And so the fact that these lingering eastern hemlocks in controlled greenhouse settings have significantly higher levels of like 20 terpenes is uh, worth considering. And so finally, um, you know, we wanted to figure out if any of this research mattered, and we wanted to initiate um, a test of whether the lingering eastern hemlock propagules could be used in reforestation. And so in 2015, we selected <clears throat> size and age matched lingering and eastern hemlock propagules that had been grown under identical conditions for up to two years at our URI greenhouse. And we planted these um, in, in adelgid infested forests at the eight different locations you can see on this map here. The trees were all protected from deer browse via uh, exclusion fencing, and they were left undisturbed to grow for four years. And I went out with state and federal forest service personnel in 2018, and we evaluated these trees and we collected data on survival, apical and lateral growth, drip line, DBH condition, and later elongate hemlock scale and adelgid densities. And this is what we found. 96% of lingering eastern hemlocks survived compared to just 48% of the susceptible trees. So the black bar here represents lingering hemlock survival and the gray bar is susceptible tree survival. Additionally, the lingering eastern hemlocks outperformed susceptible trees across all uh, growth metrics. So lingering eastern hemlocks were taller, they were thicker stemmed, they put out 48% more lateral growth, and they were significantly higher condition. And um, condition, I should say, was quantified visually via a five to zero scale, with five representing zero to 20% foliage loss on a given tree, and zero representing 100% defoliation or a dead tree. Um, additionally, I went back and I resurveyed all of these plots in, in 2019. And I also found that um, elongate hemlock scale densities were 60% lower on lingering hemlocks compared to susceptible trees. And that's represented in the figure on the left. I found that adelgid densities were 35% lower on lingering trees compared to susceptible trees as well. But this wasn't a um, statistically significant difference because adelgid were only present that year at one out of the eight sites. I think there was a, it was a, a polar vortex or something. There was a, a Delgin population crash, but interesting to consider nonetheless. And I also found that once again, lingering eastern hemlocks outperformed susceptible trees across all uh, growth and condition performance metrics. Again, they were taller, put out more lateral growth, had um, greater drip lines, and were 58% higher condition. So um, you know, in conclusion, uh, it seems that there's substantial evidence of intraspecific variation in eastern hemlock resistance to adelgid and now potentially uh, elongate hemlock scale as well. Um, lingering hemlocks may be considered for reforestation. You know, I think uh, we need um, to do a much more robust reforestation trial to really evaluate these trees um, for outplanting, but I think the data is there that's worth considering. 
Um, and as I said, this has been a 15 plus year project. So these have been some of the players involved. So thank you to everyone. Um, and thanks for having me give this talk. And if you have any questions, my email is listed below. All right, that's it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Ian? We do have a minute while I get my my stuff together over here. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, Ian, I was interested, you said in 2019, you only had hemolytic adelgid at one site. What, but what was the annual infestation rate of the adelgid from 2013 to 2019? Yeah, that's a really important question. The, there isn't any data on that. Um, like those trees were planted. Well, let me ask first, are you asking about the annual data on adelgid densities on the trees used in the reforestation work? On the eight sites. Okay. Yeah, that wasn't, there was, uh, I think adelgid densities were, I don't even, I think they were measured in 2015 when the trees were first planted and then they were not counted again until the first resurvey that I was involved with in 2018. It, so we only have data for at most those three seasons, which is again, why I think it would be good to, you know, maybe plant some of these trees out and do like a more long-term study where adelgid densities are monitored year after year for multiple years. So, so you don't know if all of the trees were exposed to adelgid through, since they were planted? Correct. I guess because I wasn't there when the trees were planted. I only right. got involved with this work like in 2017. But my understanding is the, the field plots where the trees were planted, and I at least saw the locations of the plots when I did the surveys, you know, they were all within adelgid infested like hemlock stands with right. the exception of, I think, one site that was in like an open common garden. So yeah, I think that part was kind of like, you know, it would, yeah, so that's sort of unknown. All right. Um, thank you for, for that uh, clarification. I'm really hoping we'll be able to keep track of those trees that were planted for the long term to see how that works out. I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our next speaker, um, Ben's going, Ben Smith's going to give us a little bit more information on uh, work that's been happening um, more close to the local area here. Uh, ben, go ahead and take it away. I apologize. Uh, I hope you can all hear me, but I have a lingering cough so, um, <laughs> and congestion. So let me know if I do start to get too quiet and I'll try to take a drink. Uh, so I want to kind of just give you a, a overview of what's been going on here in North Carolina at, based on NC State for the last decade or so. Um, so quite a bit to cover and we'll just try to uh, get through it all in a timely manner. So let me see here. I hit the arrow, so I'm gonna give it a second. Find out if it doesn't. Might have to click on the uh, slide. Go ahead. All right, I'll turn this. Okay. okay. All right. So um, I want to talk about the the different strategies that we were using to try to uh, come up with resistant hemlocks for reforestation. Um, and I, I want to also mention up front that, so this is work that was done with the Forest Restoration Alliance that thanks to Fred Hain uh, is in existence. And um, <clears throat> our ultimate goal is to produce trees that are suitable for restoration, but we also have intermediate goals um, of basically producing things that are suitable for industry uh, both, uh, and you know, basically restoring some of the income that was lost, uh, particularly in North Carolina, due to the effects of HWA and the impact on the nursery industry. Um, so some of what we did doesn't 
uh, isn't going to go directly to a product that would be suitable for restoration, but it's a it's a stepping stone along that path. Um, so the first strategy, or, <clears throat> so we started in 2011 and basically embarked on multiple strategies at that time because we didn't want to uh, pick just one strategy and have it become a dead end and have to restart and uh, lose time. So we were pursuing multiple prongs simultaneously. One prong that we were taking was using hybridization and back crossing. So this is similar to what the American Chestnut Foundation has been doing for decades. Um, and our work built on work at the U.S. National Arboretum, who had started making hybrid hemlock crosses back in the early 90s. Um, and we started breeding in 2011. It was the first year that I came on uh, working with hemlock. Um, <clears throat> and I, I happen to think that the, the cones and pollen and all that that develops on, particularly on uh, Carolina hemlock, but but our native hemlocks are they're beautiful structures. So if you've never actually taken the time to look at them, you should you should uh, try to study them sometime because they're they're pretty cool. But I may be biased. <coughs> um, so we we started producing hybrids in 2011, uh, and we were mainly working with Chinese hemlock, and uh, then some southern Japanese hemlock and a little bit of northern Japanese hemlock pollen that was collected at remote locations and then we were uh, pollinating that onto Carolina hemlock in the in the western North Carolina area um, and and the main reason for that was that we didn't have local sources for that um, <clears throat> for the pollen and to and the trees to use for breeding um, so once we had started producing those crosses one of the steps in in uh, a hybrid breeding program is that you've got to verify that they're actually hybrids. And so uh, we've got Dana Nelson here help me uh, with connections at the, in, at the um, Forest Services, uh, Forest Genetics Lab um, out of Soche, Mississippi. And we worked with them to, well, we supplied them the material and they supplied the expertise in, in developing markers. So used uh, SSR markers initially with nuclear DNA, trying to identify the, the hybrids and come up with species-specific uh, species markers that would allow us to, to verify the parentage. Um, and that uh, <clears throat> gave us mixed results. It was not very clear. And so we ended up switching to chloroplast DNA markers. And in, in uh, hemlocks, chloroplast DNA is inherited strictly from the paternal parent. And so because we were using pollen from exotic hemlocks, that would be what conferred the, the um, chloroplast DNA in true hybrids. And so if it showed up as uh, with the markers for the, for the uh, exotics, then we knew it was a hybrid. And if it didn't, then we knew it was contamination. Um, <clears throat> and we were able to verify about a hundred uh, different hybrid crosses, um, different genotypes. And uh, almost, almost all of the um, hybrids that were analyzed, or all of the genotypes that were analyzed turned out to be hybrid with the exception uh, uh, that we'll talk about here in a minute. But um, this, this is just an example of the, the type of tissue we're collecting to, to develop those markers. So, um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Because hybridization is going to uh, produce a, a small number of genotypes and uh, potentially going to be used for ornamental type plantings where we, we're not as worried about genetic diversity. Uh, you know, again, this is a more of an industry product. We worked with the Merkel Lab at, at University of Georgia um, to develop uh, somatic embryogenesis techniques that would work in in these hybrid hemlocks so that we could use it both for testing the hybrids for resistance to the Delgid, and then also uh, if we made any selections that, for release that then we could use that as a uh, propagation uh, method for uh, producing those cultivars. Um, and they were successful in 
in developing protocols that worked uh, in these high, in hybrids. Um, and so you can see some examples of Carolina by Chinese hybrids here that were produced using somatic embryogenesis. But the other, there's an additional reason that we were interested in somatic embryogenesis, and that's that <clears throat> uh, all the hybrids that have been successfully verified have a Carolina hemlock parent, not an Eastern hemlock parent. And of course, Carolina hemlock has a much more limited range. And so uh, that hybrid and the back process from that hybrid are sort of a dead end for restoring the, the range of Eastern hemlock because it's just not going to be adapted and it's not going to be filling the same um, ecological niche that, that Eastern hemlock would. Um, <clears throat> but we knew from work that the U.S. National Arboretum had done that um, the, the barrier to that producing that hybrid with Eastern hemlock and any of the resistant Asian hemlocks <clears throat> is post-zygotic. So you get fertilization, the, the seed would basically begin to develop, and then within a few weeks after um, starting development, it would spontaneously abort. And so we were hoping that we could use a technique called embryo rescue uh, using somatic embryo embryogenesis to get that embryo out of the seed where we know if we just leave it there, it's going to abort, but get it into tissue culture um, and then potentially treat it with different hormones and chemicals that would keep it alive and be able to produce a viable um, plant from that. Um, unfortunately, spoiler alert, it didn't work so far. So, um, <clears throat> but th there's always a chance that that could be successful in the future, but um, we've decided to, to focus on other areas. Um, at the same time as that hybrid breeding that we were conducting was going on. We were also collaborating with the U.S. National Arboretum um, to help test the material that they had produced back in the early 90s um, so that they could determine whether it was going to be adapted to the Southern Appalachians and would be suitable for uh, wide-scale release uh, and, and that they would have some level of confidence that it would actually grow and do well in, in the Southern Appalachians. Uh, so in 2011, we put in a, a planting at the Upper Mountain Research Station, um, a little over 100 trees total. It was a, a mixture of different hybrids that they had uh, clonally propagated from the original selections uh, using root cuttings. And then uh, so we had clonal replication within this, this study site. Um, and fortunately, they've now actually uh, released two of those hybrid selections. Uh, one in 2020 and then one this year. Uh, so they're named Traveler and Crossroad. Um, and you can see this, uh, the picture on the uh, left was the final measurements that we did in 2017 with the National Arboretum before they made their final selections for release. Um, so they, they did quite well. Uh, survival was really, really good. Um, so we're pretty confident that they'll thrive in the Southern Appalachians in a ornamental type setting. Again, this is not suitable for restoration. This is a 50-50 hybrid of uh, Chinese and Carolina hemlocks. Um, <clears throat> because we had access to that planning, we were able to um, get an agreement in place with the National Arboretum to allow us to use that material for breeding purposes. And so we started making back crosses in 2019 using material that was collected from that planting. Um, Unfortunately, that those back crosses are unverified at this point because we'll need to revisit the nuclear versus chloroplast DNA uh, markers uh, because the uh, because the type of hybrids that the National Arboretum was was working with that we successfully back crossed uh, <clears throat> the the pollen parent on those is going to be Carolina hemlock, so we have no way of uh, differentiating between a, a true hybrid uh, versus a contamination because either one is going to have a chloroplast DNA that was inherited from Carolina and Locke. And so we've got to go back and, and develop reliable markers in nuclear DNA um, to be able to actually verify that. Um, and of the two selections that they've released, the, we had pollen from the crossroads selection 
but it did not yield any viable seed um, in the, the initial process. We still have uh, some seed that we need to germinate and test. Um, and we, we weren't able to collect pollen from the traveler selection in 2019 when we made the, the initial collections. But uh, if I check tracking at some point today, this is coming to my uh, address and it's um, pollen that was collected off of two of the two of the trees that are the traveler clone mm -hmm. at that planting uh, that was collected by the staff at the research station when they're shipping it to me. So uh, they had very limited amounts, but hopefully we'll be able to to do some crosses in the future with that. Um, so we'll use that for back crosses. Um, so again, because Eastern hemlock has not been successfully hybridized, that's a dead end uh, as far as a restoration techn uh, a technique for, for that. And so we need other approaches besides hybridization. And so of course, what we're focused on here now and what we're mainly focusing on at this point is native resistance. So again, we're gonna to need to be able to identify uh, potentially lingering trees, and then follow the steps that, that Ian outlined. Um, and again, we're following in their footsteps. Uh, <clears throat> we eventually settled on using tree snap as a way to try to uh, collect reports of potential trees that we needed to check out. Um, and you'll, I'm sure, hear more about tree snap as the day wears on. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, these are some of the candidate trees that we've collected and have cuttings in propagation or testing from. Um, we have, in, in 2020, we identified some trees that I feel meet our criteria for lingering the best. Um, and some of those were in the Asheville watershed and then um, some are up in the Highlands area. And Kyle Purcell, who's over here, actually was the one that reported those to us. So um, I uh, hope to get good information on those in the, in the coming years. Um, and this is the, a map that just shows kind of the range where we've made collections. So we have collections from about 150 individuals that we've made uh, over the past 10 years. Um, obviously this is not every tree, this is just showing the, the kind of the range of sites. So we have North Carolina, Tennessee, and up into Virginia represented. Um, and again, as Jen mentioned, earlier, you know, you can't just make collections in a limited area and expect to, to outplant that over the range of eastern hemlock. So we've got to, we've got to capture the variation within the range of hemlock. Um, so first step in that process is rooting cuttings. Uh, we kind of treat clonal testing as a gold standard for our program. Um, uh, it's as being preferable to open pollinated seed or um, uh, and, and just to give us the, the best estimates of um, resistance. And so, you know, we worked out a few bugs, but eventually we got to where we have uh, better success at, at rooting as long as things are going well and there isn't a pandemic that keeps us from monitoring our plants. Um, so just wanted to show you an example. Uh, we've started photographing all of our trees as we lift them out of the beds and then follow them as we transplant. Um, so I can do cool graphics like this. And also so we have a record of um, how they're uh, how they're faring. So that was uh, one year of growth. There. So the first uh, image was as we took it out of the bed and then the following year. So um, so we can have some some good success with rooting. We can also have some terrible success with rooting. Um, depending on the year, and uh, there's, you know, the, the condition of the tree that it came from. The, of course, the ma more mature a tree is generally the poorer it roots. And so that's a, a, a struggle um, that's not ever necessarily going to go away because our best candidate trees are going to be mature trees. And so they're naturally a poor candidate for rooting from the start. Um, so 2015, we had a good, good first Round, really good first round of cuttings that were vigorous and, and actually were suitable for testing. So in 2017, we uh, began our first round of 
uh, intentional infestations, trying to evaluate for resistance. Um, we had, and we had 25 uh, genotypes of interest plus some controls in there. Um, it's rather unbalanced as far as the controls versus the infested because um, you know we had variable success in rooting, and so we had some individuals that rooted really well, and we had lots of rep representation, and then some that um, we didn't have a lot uh, um, of ramets or the, the propagules to work with, and so um, it, they're not as well represented. <clears throat> so the first time we infested this, we did it indoors, just took infested material, let the adelgids fall down onto it. Uh, you can see the size of the plants. So they were, again, those are two years, they were two years post collection or post uh, yeah, rooting. And so they're pretty small. The whole test fit under, the infested part fit under uh, a little over a four by eight foot area. Um, but we followed that over time. Uh, we have struggled to get good infestation to keep that infestation. Um, so, and as they've grown, then we've had to transplant them. So the second time we infested, that was, uh, took up a little bit more space and uh, they keep getting bigger. So now they're picking up almost an entire greenhouse. Uh, and we started out with about 300, just under 400 plants. And we've lost about 25% uh, just to mortality that's not, likely due to the adelgid, um, it's balanced. The, the, we get the same mortality in the controls that we have in the infested material. Um, as of the, the 2020 evaluation that we did, we couldn't detect a significant clonal differences uh, in response to the adelgid infestation, um, which of course we wanna eventually see some kind of differences that are significantly that are statistically significant so that we can make some selections for a, the, our superior individuals. Um, but we did just complete another round of measurements last week on Friday. And um, I was hoping to have some preliminary results, but I have not been able to completely, uh, to, to get a good enough analysis to present on that. But, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we're getting to where we're gonna get some more consistent results. Um, and another strategy that we're taking, again, again as, as Jen outlined earlier, this is not necessarily, it's not breeding um, technique, but we are working with the Forest Biotech Group out of NC State using different biotech um, methodologies. And we were able to leverage that SE work that was done at University of Georgia into a starting step in, the, in using uh, CRISPR for genome editing. Um, and so we worked with Jack Wang and his group at, at NC State, and they were able to take SE cultures that were started at University of Georgia and demonstrate that they could do some editing with CRISPR. And so then, of course, if you can do that, now you need to know what to edit. And so we're in the process of trying to identify some candidates for editing. Again, hoping that, you know, so again, we don't understand the mechanisms behind resistance, but um, if we can identify some of the things that are happening with the Delgid infestations, maybe we can, especially if we have detrimental responses by the tree, if we can um, minimize that response of the tree to the Delgid, perhaps we can have a positive impact on health. Um, so we have an RNA sequencing study that's underway trying to identify what's happening in the plant as they get invested with the Delgid. Um, and so you can see, so we've completed two out of three rounds of sample collections that we're gonna use uh, that will be sequenced to get an idea of what's going on in the plant. Um, <clears throat> so these are all uh, the same clone. It's not the, the, the larger picture showing the branch is not the exact same tree that the uh, um, samples came off of, but the, the two samples are at different times. So one in October, after Delta had settled, but before it really had had the winter to feed. And so um, the hemlock hasn't had as much time in that tissue to respond to the adelgid. And then we collected a second round in March. Uh, so that's after the adelgid has been feeding all winter. And we've expected that the plant is gonna be responding to the adelgid in some manner. 
And then because uh, we had infestation that came in without our uh, introducing it on, on the material we needed to work with or on a bunch of the material we need to work with, the, the third uh, round of samples will actually be on uninfested new growth um, that will be collected next month. And that will be kind of used as a baseline for what's happening when when the adelphas are not there and we can see what changes. Um, and I just wanted to cover some quick practical lessons that we've learned. Right? How am I doing? Okay. Okay. Um, so, and this kind of gets it um, just trying to improve breeding programs and, and take lessons that we've learned and, and hopefully other people can not repeat our mistakes. Um, so the first lesson that uh, we've taken to heart at this point is that um, what we thought would give us the best infestations didn't. Um, we expected that we wouldn't get great infestations in the greenhouse because um, we would see elevated temperatures in the summer that would be detrimental to the intelligence. Um, but it's not shaken out that way. We had uh, infestations that just naturally occurred in the greenhouse that were just immensely heavy. They persisted over time. At the same time, the same years where we were trying to infest our, our big study and struggling to get any adults to, to persist. And so we said, all right, we don't know why this is happening, but let's go. And so now every, every all the Screening will be in the greenhouse if it's if it's in containerized plants. Um, and you can see so the <clears throat> the image on the left there is a plant that's been in the greenhouse and been infested for years uh, where we didn't provide any adelgids, uh, but it, it's heavy enough infestation that you're getting adelgids settling on the main stem. Um, and that happens pretty frequently and and we get some some really nice heavy infestations on containerized plants that are you know just a few feet tall um we just finished enclosing the a structure that we had in place that we were using just to support shade cloth well we thought that just shade would be the, the best option but now that we're going um, doing infestations in the greenhouse no, it's now enclosed with some active ventilation and uh, and that's you can just barely see that's where the the current main study that we have going is is um, that's what it's based on. Um, <clears throat> we've learned things about rooting hemlock as well. Um, so we initially started out trying to root in in these containers like this that work great for lab wall pine in the breeding program I worked with in grad school. Um, and it probably would work well if we had a traveling boom system that gave us nice heat well, and water. Uh, is there a problem with the volume? No, nope, somebody's on their phone. Okay. Uh, but we struggled with getting uh, even water over those containers because you would get you get edges that dry out, and uh, because we're using a peat perlite mix, once it dries out. Um, that your, your cutting is going to die because it's really hard to re-wet. Um, <clears throat> and so we tried different things over the years, uh, tenting, trying to get better or more even moisture, then going to a, kind of a, a bed of media on a bench. Um, we eventually settled on just doing some outdoor beds that are inexpensive. But for about well before lumber went crazy, um, we could put together one a four by eight bed for about a hundred bucks, and uh, and the first year we did that we had we we jumped from in the twenties percentile of successful rooting up into like fifty five percent the very first year, uh, and the material that's coming out of those beds is much better, much more vigorous and extensive root systems. Uh, we had. Plants that we were pulling out that had to go straight into a two gallon container because they were way too big for, to, for the containers we'd used previously. Um, and, uh, you know, we can get about 800 cuttings in a, in a bed, and it's pretty inexpensive to, to set up. Um, another thing that we've uh, done is, is, you know, 
the hybrid breeding work has given us some insight into working with hemlock and, and breeding on eastern and Carolina hemlock. Um, <clears throat> and we found that although we can collect the pollen scrub as they're developing and, and dry them directly, uh, we get much better results if we do cut branches and, and put them in water and let them shed naturally. Um, but we are able to force them a little bit and, and accelerate that process. So uh, that allows us to, to manipulate timing a little bit so we can, um, we can produce pollen in time to use it that same year. Whereas uh, if we weren't forcing it indoors, uh, it would develop too late to be of use to us in that year. Um, we also tried different pollination bags and found that because of the cone arrangement on hemlock, uh, these bigger, longer bags work much better for us. Um, you know, just little practical things that will make a difference to the breeding programs as we go forward. Um, also, because of the, the nature of the way hemlock produces pollen uh, compared to, like say, the southern pines, we're working with much, much smaller quantities of pollen than, than say, the loblight pine breeding programs are accustomed to dealing with. They can, they can apply five milliliters in a bag and, you know, have gallons of pollen to work with. And <clears throat> we're at best putting in a half milliliter or maybe a milliliter per bag. And, um, and so we've moved away from the, the type of pollination equipment that they've used and developed a, just a, a simple system using compressed air that I can effectively apply, you know, very small amounts of pollen and, and get good coverage within those bags. Um, and it also gives me some flexibility on, on uh, dealing with the pollen for the setting up the crosses ahead of time. Um, the other thing we found in, in processing seed uh, is that uh, the only effective thing that we've found to, to separate out good seed from bad is, is a seed blower. So it's definitely uh, an investment worth looking into if you're, if you're working with seed where you, you may have very low uh, seed set and you want to eliminate all the seed. And uh, lots of people have been involved. So, and the reason we're working on this is for the next generation. Thanks. There was a question in the chat. Um, Dave Mazel is asking if there's a concern with hemlock hybrids being released into the environment. Thinking about butternut and Japanese walnut hybrids that were released in the challenges that was raised with pure butternuts. Um, I don't know of any concerns that I would have uh, <clears throat> because so right now the, the hybrid would be hopefully you can hear me Dave um, the hybrid right now is strictly for ornamental use um, and because it's got a Carolina and Chinese parents it's not going to hybridize with the eastern hemlock that it's likely going to be in the natural range of so because Carolina hemlock has such a limited natural range to begin with um, you know, chances are someone's planting it. It's not even. All righty then. All right, you're not muted, so they should be able to hear you from where you're at. But if anybody online has trouble hearing, please let us know in the chat. And so, and yeah, we have a lot of activity in our room, as you guys can't see, but but we'll be all right. Okay, if I can not drop the computer. Can you guys hear me? Let me get a little louder. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about TreeSnap. It has been around for six years now, and this is a partnership with Ellen Crocker, who is an extension forestry professor at the University of Kentucky. Fantastic on the extension and outreach side. My lab is really much more on the computational writing the code side. Um, so we originally wrote TreeSnap to help any resistance breeding program, um, but in particular, one of our first models is the American Chestnut Foundation, and, and thinking about how we can leverage citizen scientists um, or even professional foresters who are out on the landscape to find these trees that scientists really need and report them back. Um, so we wanted to develop a mobile app, which I will show here, hopefully. 
I always feel like it's a miracle when this works. It looks like it's going to work. Um, so the upper left is the little tree, round tree logo. That's TreeSnap. Um, if you open it up, it is going to require you to give us your email address. That is the only personal data we collect. Um, and you need to allow it to access your GPS location and your camera. So I just like to warn people, it is going to ask you and please say yes, because otherwise the data you, you said this isn't very helpful. Um, so it, it will try to give you a list of species that are relevant to researchers in your state. So if we were sitting in California, you would not see most of these species. You would see Pacific Madrone and other species out there. So it tries to be a little bit smart about that. Um, we have added hemlock. Actually, we worked with Ben Smith right at the beginning of TreeSnap to develop a very simple form to report um, a sighting of hemlock um, and ask about woolly adelgid. Um, but with the working group, we've really beefed up all of the things um, that you can report. This is the beta version. Um, we basically took the output of the working group, we coded it up, and put it into this new test version of TreeSnap that may or may not actually work yet. So one of the things I will be working with people this afternoon to do is test and see if this works. But in general, you can see you can add images, you know, and this is why access to the camera, very important. Um, we, we won't actually use that image. Um, you can say whether or not you've been trained. Um, some of the more interesting ones, you know, the percent woolly adelgid, and you can see it has a little show examples button that you can click and kind of look at what does adelgid look like. And we'll be improving these photos so that you can kind of figure out what should 20% adelgid look like? What does 100% adelgid look like? We want those reference photos. So as Tamara mentioned, that, that if you have any, that'd be really helpful. Um, and just tons of, tons of different questions. It does take a minute to fill out the form. So get ready. Um, and it'll ask you if you want to do further assessment, and if you have time, it'll now give you the option to look around at nearby trees, tell us about their health, tell us about whether or not you know of any active management. Um, and this whole time, while you're spending 10 minutes or so filling out the form, it's using the GPS chip in your phone to figure out your location. Um, when you're outside, so here it's saying 35 meters. This is because I'm in a building. Your GPS chip doesn't work well when you're in a building. When you're outside, we're getting five to 10 meter accuracy on most phones, which is not bad. It does kind of, the age of your phone will matter. Uh, newer phones will give you slightly more accurate. Um, if that doesn't work, you can click more options and manually enter your GPS coordinates. Generally people, that doesn't work well. We often have like little trees sitting out in the ocean. So we prefer for your GPS chip, <laughs> just go with what your GPS chip says. Um, we also have this kind of informational tab at the top. Um, again, ID photos, um, thinking about Eastern versus Carolina hemlock um, and different ranges. Um, we have our distribution maps and tons of information. Uh, so, yep, that's tree snap in a nutshell. Um, and we'd love for you guys to use it for any of these species. We do have scientists on the other end of all of these species interested in that data. So I'll move over real quick to the website. Um, oh, a couple more things about the app. It's free. <laughs> it, it works on iPhone and on Android. Um, and also it will work if you have no cellular coverage and no Wi-Fi. That is not a problem. Your GPS chip will still work. We've actually tested this in other countries all over the world. It works great. Um, but when you go back home or to your office, it's going to pop up a little notification. Everybody loves notifications. Um, and it says, will you please upload your data? And at that point, you'll have an option to click a button. So storing those photos, storing that information on your phone, you can go out and trace that 50 trees. It'll store all of that on your phone. And then when you go back home, you can upload all of that to the server so that we get access. Um, so that was a really important part of um, when we developed it, because a lot of the forests that we're interested in, you know, you're just not going to have cellular coverage. So if you go to the website, um, we have a map of all of our trees. If you are not logged in, all of these trees are going to have buzzified coordinates. I don't know if buzzified is a real word, but that's the word we use, um, where we kind of move those coordinates around within a five mile radius. So if you're tagging something that's a valuable lingering tree, you don't want people to go out, destroy it, cut it down. Particularly the American chestnut people were the ones who first alerted us to the fact that that, that is a thing. So, um, so that's good. But once you log in, you can see your own trees. And anyone in this room, in particular scientists, we can upgrade your account 
to a scientist level account. And that means you get all of the accurate coordinates, but we only do that for people that we trust. Um, you can filter, you know, kind of look at, let's look at all of our hemlock entries. Uh, we really need a lot of people to get out there and start tagging hemlock because we don't have too many yet, um, a few sporadically. Um, and you can click on them. And if it's public, you can go see that this is Alan, um, the other PI on this project, all of the information that she has filled out. Um, you can click through her photos. So again, we're trying to get a lot of information so that we can determine if this is a lingering tree, is it worth somebody's time to actually drive out there and collect it? That's the big thing. That's why we're collecting so much data because we've got to make decisions <laughs> about whether or not um, you know, you're actually going to hike through the forest or drive out there. Um, if you're a scientist, you can also download things in Excel format. Um, you can filter. You can go through and um, mark things as, let me just show you the admins. So you get like a little dashboard. You can see all the registered users and all the recorded observations. Um, and you can go here. And if you're a scientist, you can click, yes, this is the right species or no, this is, this is not the right species. Um, so, so that those sort of tools do exist on the back end. Um, so I think that's about it for super high level overview of tree snap. Um, and I think we can save questions for the working groups. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, yeah that'd be fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for showing us that for people who haven't seen any of that before. Yeah. All right, then. So with that, um, is there anybody uh, online who has any uh, questions or comments? And then uh, we'll see if anybody in-house either has anything they want to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, question for Meg. Sure. Um, reassessment, yes or no, what does that mean? Yeah, so fortunately with this Trees and Perils project, we got a little bit of development money and the first thing we tackled was security updates <laughs> so that Apple would let us continue to exist in their ecosystem. Um, the second thing we tackled is the new hemlock lingering um, form. And the third thing we can tackle is, is reassessment. So that's a big, I, I guess it'd be good for this group to talk about how you want to do reassessments if you're not tagging the tree. You can go back through your own observations and click it and update the form. Um, we could update it that way, or if you want to have individual tree numbers, we can do that. So that is that is the third thing on the list for this grant. Just so everybody online hears that, uh, it's about reassessments of the tree data, and uh, they're still working on being able to make sure that we have the tree snap ability for the long term for reassessments, but also um, when you do go back to do reassessments on an individual tree. Currently, it's making a new entry um, right. and uh, for that same tree. And so uh, that's why there's indicators in, in there, like adding a comment, like this is the tree tag, this number. So we know that it, we have it twice, but it also saves the date that you entered it. So we know when that happened. Anything else? What were you, was it a follow-up question? Yeah, there was. Okay, go ahead. The mortality monitoring map that you plan on integrating um, you know, I've got my tree snap open, it knows my GPS, it can tell me that in this particular region, you know, there's 80% mortality in hemlock, and so maybe I should you know, be paying special attention to looking for lingering hemlocks, or do there's only 10% mortality or something like that. So it's an analogous to John and Um, and yeah. Yeah, so um, you have like a hemlock dashboard that just has hemlock data on the map that you could log in and, um, and be able to see where it's monitoring and the lingering hemlock kind of overlaid. Um, another option would be to do this through car cover plants and have it in the wires and in here because they need to also with the environmental layers, which is quite yeah. it probably can vary with uh, environmental layers. So I think mean, that's what we're looking for. Although Jill doesn't know that yet. <laughs> 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 driving along to get an alert. Yeah. Go ahead, Samara. Well, I, the thing is, I don't know if the owl tracks or not. So, um, I'm sorry, so. One of the things that our group, our working group, talked about the fact is there are no, there are no region wide anyway 
uh, hemlock mortality maps that are easily accessible. So unlike what's happening where Jonathan has been able in the um, ERI project has been able to build those, this is ready to search maps, that does not yet exist for hemlock. And our group spent a good part of time talking about whether we could tackle that question and also start building regional mortality maps. And we said, again, many parts of the hemlock, the hemlock uh, uh, web, but we're working on trying to identify lingering hemlock trees and trying to develop a regional mortality map was beyond the scope of what our group was tasked with. So a very small little piece of that is that if you can, uh, if tree snap is going to be able to potentially get that null value data, I didn't find any hemlock here because either it's all dead or not enough of it is dead yet, that might start giving us some more information about stand characteristics as that gets populated. But the purpose of that is not to generate a regional mortality map. There might be some places where regional mortality is pretty well known, but I don't, we're not at the point yet where you're going to be able to get an alert on your phone that you're driving through an area that's ready for a lingering hemlock search. But who knows? We're learning a lot every year about them. Um, I also wanted to note that when there was a reassessment question, it was about reassessing trees that are already inputted into tree snap and or some new trees and being able to go back and look at those. Uh, tree, the, the tree snap developers will be again developing a new app to be able to collect plot data. So if you have a group of lingering trees that you expect to come back to time after time after time again, you might choose to use the new app when you're going to enter in that group of trees instead of tree snap because that's going to be set up if you've got a tag tree and you're coming back to it again and again and again that's going to be set up to be able to collect that data over time. Um, but they're also, uh, tree staff is also working on a way to reassess some of those trees we already know about, especially individual trees hanging out, easily locatable, that don't have a tag. Wonderful. Another couple of follow-ups. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I got nothing online. Hopefully they can hear us. So uh, state people, um, it, it seems to me that like HWA has by county within your state, there's year of first occurrence or observation. And it seems like that would be a good surrogate for you know you for building a mortality map for the uh, severity map of HWA. Now, how long is how long is is HWA been been first observed in this county? And that's got to be there's got to be a relationship between the length of time and the amount of damage to the trees or mortality that could be utilized to fill the first sort of mortality map or uh, severity map or something like that. Is that true or no? I could say the crash, that's when we start populating the maps. Okay, the first first yeah. occurrence in a county. Is that project forward? All the states that can do that. Yeah, yeah, we'll be able to get first occurrence for HWA per county as sort of a, a baseline and then see if, if there's local people who have collected data already that can give us some more information on that. And then at the higher end level, it's the FIA data um, analysis that, that the Forest Service is working on in order to see if there's something that they can project as well at, at a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So both large and small scales uh, can be used in order to, to see where we should go. Uh, Jennifer was saying that we might want to have reference photos of Adelgid at different times of the year, and um, we might end up getting 0% HWA if it's at the wrong time of the year. Uh, it might not already be included, but that's something that we should keep in mind. We have some of that included. I can't remember. We have, we have at least one at, you know, at the early system stage in, in, the, in, the, app. in the print version. In the print version, you'll see a little bit of that showing through and how we would end up changing it. So what um, Meg just showed is the final product. We already collect the date and the time that somebody is. Yes, yes, data. right. But from our experience, um, the breeders who are actually going out and sampling lingering ash are going to focus on their trained volunteers and filter some data from those trained volunteers. So 
I found it's actually relatively rare that when the public is out just tagging, you know, tagging a hemlock or a chestnut in the middle of winter, that that data ends up being used. So I, I think a lot of the focus here is on um, we want tree snap to be as self-explanatory as possible, but also the matching volunteer training system mm -hmm. and getting people to kind of think about questions like this um, and reporting really good data. That's just as important. Right. Right. And why we had put the uh, are you have you been trained? Right. In, in, into it. So, so that will help us out as well. All righty. Uh, what we have now is some time to uh, get ready for lunch. Yeah, I <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jill Wagerthin. I'm at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I'm actually here with Carl, who's right to stand in the back, who's a postdoc in our group, and also Vidya, um, who's a graduate student. And so this is, represents kind of our collective work in Eastern Hemlock. Um, we are funded through the Trees of in Peril uh, grant, grant through the Nature Conservancy, as well as a couple other places as well, and sort of talk about a little bit of our research going on there. Okay, so this very busy slide just kind of gives an overview of the areas that we're working on, starting kind of with generating the Eastern Hemlock reference genome, thinking about terpenoid time course sampling, moving into sort of population level questions and sampling, and then building resources that will hopefully complement a lot of the work that um, Jen and Rachel uh, are going to be working on in terms of integrating this bioassay in the populations later. So I always want to start with this little image here to remind everybody that conifer genomes are really, really, really big and <laughs> challenging to work with. So right there in the very far corner of that view, are a lot of our kind of crop species or plant biology model species like Arabidopsis, and they represent pretty small genomes. Everything else kind of extending out from that represents a lot of conifer genomes. And so the uh, hemlock genome kind of sits right around where spruce is, Picea, in terms of size. And so we're starting that process of generating sequence for Eastern hemlock. And just kind of an overview without going into too much detail, we're essentially generating a whole bunch of short reads, what we call short read sequence, and a lot of long read sequence. And it's this long read sequence that is available today that allows us to put together these very complex genomes that we have with very large components of their genome that are composed of repetitive elements. So conifers present as many challenges that we've talked about today, but also just in putting together their genomes. So this is a process that we're under right now. Um, this is sort of our timeline for getting that reference genome available to the community. Um, so we're still at the sequencing stage. We have our already have all of our short read sequence completed, and we're uh, about halfway through generating our long read sequence right now. So the goal is to hopefully have a reference genome in early fall if all goes well. So why do we need to generate this reference genome? Well, the hope is that this reference will provide um, a resource to look at a, a variation across the range, to look at things like our diversity estimates, um, eventually to help us understand what components of the genome are contributing to resistance. Um, I heard about a couple RNA-seq or expression work going on. So the reference genome is actually gonna be very, very useful. Um, and mapping that expression data onto it in order to get more accurate um, evaluations of expression. And of course, it's going to serve as a basis for a lot of evolutionary questions, um, especially related to HWA interactions. And so the individual that is chosen as the reference uh, resides at the Arnold Arboretum. Um, and it's actually grafted from a plant from 1882 and was found locally on Hemlock Hill. So a pretty cool specimen. And so this is going to be and is already through part of its sequencing now. And so I just wanted to kind of briefly go through, and a lot of this has already been talked about today, a little bit of where we started and where we're going with what we're doing in Eastern Hemlock now. Um, but Vidya, who I mentioned before, has been working on looking at basically the differences between host hemlock species. And so here, as we've already talked about, we have our most susceptible species, Carolina, and also Eastern Hemlock, our more tolerant species, and then those that are resistant. And as we heard earlier today, 11 of the 13 Hemlock species 
are considered to be some level of tolerant or resistant to hemlock woolly adelgid. And so building on work that has been looked at to date, um, this particular study examined the difference between eastern hemlock to resistant species, chinensis and dumosa, and a more tolerant species, sebuldii, and looked at HWA density quantified in the laboratory, in the field, and in natural stands, and of course saw a really substantial difference between these species in terms of density in all of these different capacities. And so a lot of this can be attributed to many things, and we haven't really worked out the contribution of all of these factors across these species, certainly aspects of the actual physiology, the cuticle thickness, the microbial component, which is being studied in hemlock, and but also what's, we, we've been looking at a lot in other groups as well is the terpenoid chemistry and the differences there and how that's contributing to resistance. And so here's highlighting a bit of Vidya's work. We took a single time point analysis terpenoid assessment across hemlock species at Arnold Arboretum. And the chemical <laughs> compounds that you see highlighted in green are act um, essentially as deterrents, or sorry, the other way around, as attractants, and those that highlighted in red um, are uh, basically bring uh, or attract the, uh, the uh, uh, delta to the trees. And so we represent six species in this study. We've kind of grouped our susceptible, tolerant, and resistant uh, species together. And what we see is essentially what has been identified before. Um, I'm trying to load that. There we go. So essentially, three other studies, just like this one, have identified that these particular terpenes are the most significant. We see the same thing in these populations as well for those that we assessed. Um, but it still isn't really giving us the fine scale resolution that we need to really understand what's going on. Another component of this particular study was not just to look at what's happening between these species in terms of the terpenoid profiles, but also to start to look at what's happening in terms of gene expression. So this is the first time we also looked at RNA-seq data from three of the species in the original study. And without going into too many details here, we were able to identify at this point connections between what's happening in terms of our gene families and the pathways that produce these terpenes and a relationship there, which means we're we have the beginning blocks of being able to develop these resources. Given that this is a single time point analysis, we, this is not going to be representative. We're not going to be able to look at this in a quantifiable way, but it's something that we can build on in terms of the connection between these profiles and the genetics that underlie what we're seeing here. And so that's looking across the different host species, but based on what we saw in that original study and what many other studies have looked at, we know that there's variation that we've talked about today in Eastern Hemlock. And so we heard today from Ian um, and this particular study in terms of monitoring these plots of both the bulletproof individuals across landscape and in common gardens at URI. And they were seen and we saw re notable differences, right, in terms of all different aspects of their phenotype. And in terms of terpenes, we also talked about this study a little bit earlier, the McKenzie et al. paper in 2014, which looked at five genotypes from that New Jersey lingering population, and also looked at these in a common garden environment, and monitored both twig and needle terpenes in this study, and identified that there were significant differences between what were the lingering individuals and the more susceptible individuals, particularly when observed in early fall. And so this is an area that we want to continue to explore, both in terms of what are those chemical component differences and what other lingering populations can we monitor in that context. And so taking that kind of to the next step, those original New Jersey bulletproof populations are also planted at the Arnold Arboretum in terms of half-sib family. <laughs> and so those are represented here. And we're comparing those families to a set of what I would call unselected families that exist at the Arnold Arboretum as well. So it's a total of about 40 trees, um, 29 lingering individuals from seven families compared to 11 unselected, well, called unselected individuals from three families. And so what we're planning to do with these 
individuals is to actually time course sample across 10 months. Um, we already have one time point that we've assessed and we're going to be going next week to get that second time point. And when I say sample, in this case, we're actually sending that material, the both leaf and twig tissue material from those samples over to Tim Cernak's lab at University of Michigan, where that group is conducting GCMS and LCMF analysis on all of those samples. And they're gonna be doing that across all 10 of the time points. So we're trying to get a better idea of what's happening across that time scale. We're trying to get an even better idea of diving deeper into what these chemical compounds are. We're looking at lipids, we're looking at sugars, we're looking at terpenes. So we're looking at a wide range of chemical compounds and seeing if we can find, you know, reproducible differences between these lingering and unselected families. And so just very, we just got some very, very early results from our first sampling. There's a lot of work and a lot of data that that group is already diving into, but they've already been able to identify a few components. In particular, they found an interesting plastid or chloroplast-related lipid that was differentiating both the lingering and the unselected hemlocks. And this is very hot off the presses, so there's a lot of work going on in terms of diving into this. But this type of analysis is something that we can conduct on a lot of the material that folks here presented today. So in particular, the CERNAC lab is interested and wants to get as much material as they can to help out with sampling. So for those that have populations of lingering that we heard about today, um, that you would like to include into this program, we'd love to be able to try to assess and profile that material. Um, our goal is essentially is once we kind of get a handle on what's happening here, to try to bring that into a more um, controlled environment as well. But before I get into that, I also also want to highlight Carl's work. Um, Carl has received funding from the USDA NEPA to actually work in conservation genetics at Eastern Hemlock, which is very exciting. And his work is actually going to focus on range-wide, um, well, targeted range-wide sampling using and genotyping those and looking at climate adapted variation. Um, and so I think Carl's been talking to folks today about getting seed material or material for that purpose. Um, and so he'll be at the same time as part of this project, we're also going to try to look at regions of the range where we are seeing lingering hemlock. And I think a lot of the discussions we're having today about how to identify lingering hemlock will be very uh, helpful both to collect seed, but also to identify these lingering stands for repeated assessment um, and to identify both for seed collection, but also to um, assess terpenes in a repeated manner. And so that's something that we'll be doing um, kind of in collaboration between the Trees Apparel work and also Carl's work funded through the USDA. And in both of these, um, we're trying to combine sampling to acquire hopefully over 800 accessions um, and we'll probably be talking to folks about coordinating sampling and aspects of that as well. All right, so coming all together <laughs> in terms of bringing this back out from the landscape and into a more controlled environment, one of our goals is of course, to look at this in a greenhouse environment. And from hearing a lot of groups talk today, I think what we'll want to do is work with some of the existing material but we're also right now working on developing protocols to germinate seed. And that's something that Vidya has been working on um, with a, a other members of the lab in order to try to go through different protocols and identify optimized methods for doing that. Um, we have a challenge, of course, with getting seed material, as I heard many of are. So that is something that would be helpful to us. Um, but the goal here is actually to develop experiments in the greenhouse where we can continue to measure terpene profiles, controlling for a lot of these environmental factors, and to combine this study in such a way that we can do family-based assessments and sample early on, but then also grow up our hemlocks um, into a more mature state and then do that study at the individual level. So doing both family-based and individual assessments. Um, but again, at this stage, we're interested in getting seed and potentially material for that. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, which I realize will kind of connect a lot with the conversations that we've been having about tree sap, is a little bit about cartographer plant. 
So currently, the data that gets collected through TreeSnap and other sources can come into Cartographer Plan. So this is essentially a user-friendly web-based, map-based platform that allows you to perform meta-analysis and connects genotype, phenotype, and environmental data. And so we do this for geo-reference plants in general, though it actually started as Cartographer Tree and has recently converted to Cartographer Plants. Um, so this is the, just a view of the interface. You have all of your trees that you can search by a particular species. You can search by what traits have been measured. You can search by region. And then it's connected to a set of environmental layers. And we pull environmental information from a lot of different sources in order to populate the database. And one of the aspects that may be useful in sort of the conversations that we're having today is a lot of this environmental data can be connected with the things that come in through TreeSnap. So we can identify things like uh, watersheds or precipitation or whether we're in a, you know, a suburban or a park or natural forest environment. So that information can help correct or add to information that's been collected through TreeSnap and made available through the system that way. And in addition to that, one of the benefits of this is if some of these individuals are go on for further analysis, say gene expression analysis or terpenoid profiling or other types of analysis, that data can be integrated into the same framework as well. And so that information can come in, be connected to those original accessions, and all of the environmental data that's connected to that is in that geo-reference framework. And so I just have a few views of the cartographer plant interface. So you're able, like I said, to kind of zoom in, do, uh, you can search by study, you can search by species, trait that's been measured. Um, you can even search by a particular accession if you know that from TreeSnap. You can go in, you can view that accession, and then you can get more information about the, uh, what was collected through the app, as well as the environmental information that's associated with it. And so you can load any number of those environmental layers and integrate that data. And one of the primary ways that we bring in this data, in addition to a lot of the applications, is actually to have researchers uh, bringing that information in directly to the framework. And we kind of walk them through a set of questions, sort of similar to what TreeSnap is doing, but this is going to be more associated with the experimental design. And this is where it allows us to handle things like plot designs, half sieves. <clears throat> Um, different types of common gardens that you might have. And by walking through that setup, it enables us to look at that information and understand how that information is interpreted and the relationships between the trees in the framework. And so that goes through a process to bring that data in and can be connected on the other side to tree snap data, for example. And here's tree snap. And then here is just another view where you have the ability to look at tree, specific tree identification information, as well as integrated environmental information as well. Again, being able to go and then jump into the full view on a particular study. And like I said, it can hold everything from phenotypic measures and data to also genotypic measures and marker information as well. Another view of that information. And then on the final screen, I just wanted to show one of the strengths of this platform in particular. And I think this speaks a bit to this idea of when we're using high throughput genomics, we're using high throughput metabolomics data. A lot of that information gets put into a study. It's never accessible again. And so as Jennifer mentioned earlier at the beginning of this talk, how do we bring this information back to people who can use this information? And this is one of the ways that we hope to do that. And so by holding this, we can reassess, we can revalidate that particular regions of the genome are contributing to aspects of resistance. We can keep those markers in a centralized manner. We can connect these records to say seed repositories or tissue material. And so by integrating all of this together, it provides a lot more value I mean, going from really a field to analysis type of framework. And on this screen here, if you're logged into the system, you actually have the ability to run your own types of analyses and your own meta-analysis in the framework. And you can select things like I want to do a genotype to environment analysis or genotype to phenotype analysis. And that's going to enable you to select one or many studies, look at what's happening between traits. It's going to enable analysis where that's possible based on the marker types. But it adds a lot of value to the data that's there. And that's all because we've 
really carefully curated kind of what's coming in and the meta analysis or the metadata on that data as it moves in. And so this is just a really high level view of how that works, moving from being able to search data in a variety of ways, organize and filter that data for genotyping and type and environment, and then have all that analysis sort of powered on the back end through high performance computing. And so with that, I just wanted to highlight everybody involved, um, both with our lab and Tim Cernak's lab, doing all of our chemical profiling and all the work that's to come. So lots of things to come on the Hemlock side. But right now, I think, you know, we're very interested in chatting with everybody about what material you might want to get chemical profiling on, where there are lingering families that would, that would um, benefit from this type of analysis, since I think this is the opportunity to do that. And with that, we have lots of support from many places to do all of this. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Uh, does anybody have any questions? One in the front here, and then I'll look online. Question. So, so repeatedly came up how there are all these different databases for, um, for instance, plot data and so forth for Hemlock. And some of them are using different uh, evaluations of health status, say if you look at the health and so forth. Um, what is the is there any potential to use Cartagra to synthesize across these data sets to look at some of the big questions? Yeah, one of the things that we do as part of the sort of our data imports mechanism is to map basically the way that we measure things, various traits onto the same ontological framework. And so we can do that, and we have done that. That's something that we're already doing across different studies, right? So people measure things. Sometimes it's really a true difference. Sometimes it's not a difference. Sometimes it's a naming difference. And so we try to work that out, map it onto the ontology so that when you search those things in the framework, you're getting the same information that way. So yes. So if potentially without forcing everything into the same boxes, we can it's we can still get value out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of times, because a, a, primarily we were getting a lot of this information after it's been published, right? So we're always doing that after the fact and kind of mapping everything onto those frameworks. So yes, yeah, so that's something we, we spent a lot of time on. All right, good. I, I don't see anything online at the moment, so I'm going to leave that. And 